Hey everyone, this is Mike from vSwitch Zero here. So today I'm gonna to do another repair video. And in my hands I have the Imagine 128 Series 2 made by a company called Number 9 Visual Technologies. So Number 9 is a company that was pretty well known for their very unique, high quality, and expensive graphics cards from the mid 90s. And the Imagine 128 Series 2 was a very special video card because it was absolutely state of the art when it was released back in 96. I never owned one of these back in the day, but I always thought the number 9 stuff was really cool. And uh, I wasn't really looking for one specifically, but I did come across a great deal for one on eBay and I jumped on it. And unfortunately, it's broken. <laughs> so unlike some of my recent videos, I didn't intentionally buy this one broken. The seller uh, sold it to me in working condition, but as I'll show you in a bit, testing this card properly is actually a bit more involved than your average video card. And unfortunately, it just wasn't worth sending it back to the US for a refund because the you know return shipping fees and customs tax, I just wouldn't get any of that back. So in the end, the seller was good about it and he at least gave me a partial refund and he let me keep the card. And uh, it got tossed into my ever-growing backlog of defective parts needing repair. So I'd love to dive into you know what makes this card really special and all of its features and things like that, but I'm going to save that for another video, otherwise this is going to get awfully, awfully long here. So I just want to cover some of the relevant hardware bits and then we'll get to work repairing this thing. So just a really quick hardware overview of this card. So you can see here at the front of the card there's a great big Imagine 128 uh, chip here. It's sort of uh, an impressive looking big square monolith that's you know, quite a bit bigger than your typical graphics chipset in 96. And it really kind of hints at the impressive features that this thing offers. But if you look more closely, there's a few unusual details on this card that are quite easy to miss here. So, you know, you've got your IBM EDO memory here, the 60 nanosecond chips and some more on the back. You've got a high quality IBM palette DAC here for your digital to analog conversion for your analog signal. Um, but if you look closely, you'll see there's a memory IC that kind of looks out of place here. So this is an NEC 70 nanosecond part. It's a different packaging, different speed, different type, and uh, really doesn't quite match the other ones. And you can see there's actually a, an SOJ socket down here for another one of those as well. So why does this card have two different types of memory on it? That's kind of strange, isn't it? Well, if I flip the card over, you'll see a completely run-of-the-mill, not very terribly exciting Cyrus Logic GD5424 chip. This is a very basic non-accelerated chipset that has its own integrated RAM DAC and it's connected to the 512 kilobytes of memory that are on the front side of the card. So yeah, kind of weird, right? 512 kilobyte GD5424 card on its own would not be impressive or exciting to talk about, I'll tell you. So in a way, this is actually two video cards in one here. You've got a very basic chip to handle all of the, you know, text-based output, VGA graphics and stuff like that. And then you've got your other really high performance accelerated chip for your your Windows GUI acceleration basically. And I'm not 100% sure why number 9 went this route, but I assume it's because the Imagine 128 2 maybe wasn't quite ready for prime time with the normal video modes. I have heard rumors that there is a BIOS out there somewhere that'll allow this uh, 128 chip to handle all of the graphics duties including text-based graphics and uh, you know 320 by 200 VGA and that sort of thing. But uh, I've still got to look more into it, so don't quote me on this. So just before I show you what's wrong with this thing, I wanted to show you something kind of cool. As far as I know, all of the number nine cards have hidden quotes from uh, Beatles songs on their PCBs, which is kind of neat. You just hold it up to the light and you'll actually see it show up. So I'm not sure if you can see that, but I'll get a better picture. But on this one, it says number nine, eight days a week right here by the, uh, the bracket. So kind of a cool thing. And you'll also see references to uh, Beatles quotes and the BIOS messages and some silk screening. Clearly somebody at the company was a big fan. So for testing today, I'm going to use my trusty Asus P2B Slot 1 system. It's got a Celeron 300A and a slot kit adapter in it currently, and it's been a very reliable platform for me. I've got Windows 98 already installed and ready to go, so we'll get this card installed here and see what happens. So booting up the system, you can see the VGA BIOS message displayed here, and everything appears to look okay. But again, we're not using the Imagine 128.2 chip at all yet, only the Cyrus Logic that's at the back of the card. It's not until you boot up Windows that the Imagine 128 driver actually loads and hands over all the graphics duties to the accelerated chip. And this is really where all the problems start. I immediately see artifacting, usually in the form of vertical bands up and down the screen. But sometimes I get garbled text, misaligned portions of the screen, uh, color that's you know not accurate going in and out, that sort of thing. 
but clearly something's very wrong here. So in my experience, these types of artifacting problems are usually due to video card memory. I took a quick look at the card and I didn't really see any missing surface mount components or physical damage or broken traces. So my assumption is that, you know, one or more of the eight IBM memory ICs must have gone bad at some point. So the IBM chips are not socketed, obviously. So this is going to require a little bit more than, you know, your basic level of soldering and desoldering skill. Uh, I'm not a soldering expert by any stretch of the imagination, but I have been doing it a lot more recently and I feel like I'm getting better at it. I've also started doing some IC removal with hot air rework stations, so I feel like I'm just confident enough to maybe give this a shot, and that's why I picked up this specific project again. But um, the chips are actually not the most common type. They have a PDSO64 packaging, and they're 60 nanosecond EDO in a 256K by 16 configuration. And because it's an older PCI card, um, they run at five volts, not 3.3, like some of the AGP cards. Um, so the best I could find were some similarly spec to NEC branded chips. I couldn't find new old stock of the IBM chips anywhere, unfortunately. I was about to order the chips when I decided I should post something on Vogons just to see if anyone a little bit more familiar with the card had some suggestions before I start doing some major surgery on it. Also, I just wanted to see if my theory about the DRAM was likely correct. Everyone seemed to agree that it was probably a memory problem, but somebody did ask if I tried the squeeze test on the chips while the card was running. And I kind of laughed to myself because this is actually exactly how I figured out what was wrong with my Gravis ultrasound. Sometimes poking and prodding at a flaky card can actually tell you a lot, and it was certainly worth a try. If you look at the uh, chips here, so there's four IBM chips on the front and four on the back, and they're sort of positioned right on top of each other. So I should be able to just squeeze them together while it's running to see if uh, any of the artifacting changes. So let's give that a shot. At first I didn't see any change at all until I got to the very last pair of chips and amazingly I saw the artifacting change. It would either get worse or if I put enough pressure on it, it would actually clear up completely for a split second or so. I eventually found that the problem was with the chip on the back of the card and it was actually localized to one specific corner too. This was a very exciting discovery because it means that there's probably nothing at all wrong with the chip and probably just flaky contacts. In some ways I was kind of hoping to practice some chip replacement, but hey, I'm not going to complain. If it's a potentially easier fix, I'll take it. So after taking the uh, card out of the system again and having a closer look at the IC, I really can't see anything with the naked eye. So I'm going to have to break out my microscope and have a much closer look at this. So this is the corner in question here. And the only thing that sort of looks suspect under the microscope is that the pin alignment is just very slightly off for the last five or six pins here. The rest of them appear to be lined up with the pads just fine. But if I take a blade and just very, very gently push at the pins, you can see that they actually move freely from side to side. This is not a good sign and this should never happen. So it tells me that the solder joints are definitely broken here. And from what I can see, it looks like the first six pins on this side of the chip are all broken and uh, gonna need some attention. There possibly may be others, so I'll take my time and, and check the whole chip here. But uh, this is great because it should be a relatively easy fix. All I'll need to do is just clean these up and re reflow some fresh solder on the pins. And if I'm lucky, the card should be good as new again. So I gave the area a cleaning with some isopropyl alcohol and I'm just applying some flux paste here to help the solder flow. Liquid flux would have been better, but I don't have any at the moment. So this paste should work just fine though. So I need to buy a uh, finer tip point for my iron. This one's way too big here, but I should be able to get by with it. I basically just preloaded my iron with a very small amount of solder on it. And I'm going to just touch each leg here to see if I can get them reattached. I don't want to use too much solder here. Just a tiny bit should be enough. The flux leaves behind quite a bit of residue when I'm soldering here, so I'm going to have to get the whole area cleaned up with some isopropyl alcohol. And then I'll go and inspect the joints to make sure that they look okay now. So all the joints looked good with the exception of this first one here. You can see that it doesn't really move side to side, but if I put pressure on it, it does move up and down. So this one's going to need a little bit more attention. I uh, just added a bit more solder to it. And as you can see here, it now looks really solid, doesn't move at all. So I'm quite happy with the final product here. As you can see, you can't really even tell that anything's been done to the chip, aside from some slightly shinier legs from them getting tinned a bit in the process. But we're ready to try this thing out. And now for the moment of truth. Yeah, it looks great. I don't see any more garbled text or distorted images or banding going up and down the screen. 
just a nice, very clean image. So I think we got this thing fixed. I'm going to uh, run a few more tests just to be sure, but uh, this is looking really promising. So that's it for today. Turned out to be a much easier fix than I expected, which is awesome. And I'm really looking forward to trying this card out to see what it's capable of. Hopefully one day soon I'll be able to do another video on it and dig a lot deeper into its history, features, and things like that. And as always, if you enjoyed this video, please be sure to give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing. It really does help smaller YouTube channels like mine get more exposure. Thanks again.